just goes into more of the stuff that we do in premium practice on these lenses uh, that, that we're putting in. Uh, you always are told about the next lens that's out there is going to be that much better. But when it comes into it being in private practice, when we have to make that decision what lens we're going to put in, it becomes difficult and it becomes very important. Um, and I've been very involved in progression of this. Um, on our premium lenses, there's no perfect lens is what I think about. Uh, I saw, you have the Symphony lenses by Abbott. We don't even have that yet. Uh, we really have two different types of lenses. We have accommodated lenses, the one that you saw, and we have diffractive lenses. Um, but neither of these lenses are perfect for everything. You know, and I find that you have to figure it out yourself what really works. And you figure it out that by doing it on paper and trying to it out. There's no really bad lens. But I think we make bad choices sometimes. And that's what I try to do, is make good choices. And I'm sure that's what you do with all your options. But I think about it a lot. And, um, as I'm doing it, as I'm talking to my colleagues, I find the best thing to do with whatever lenses you have to choose from is to really talk to the people in your area that are also doing similar things. Go to meetings like this and talking about what are you doing? What's your favorite lens? When are you not doing that new lens? When are you doing that new lens? If you talk to enough people and the answer is the same, that's a good direction to go in. If you're the only guy doing that one type of lens, you got to rethink what you're doing and make sure that you're doing the right thing. Uh, there are some bad choices. There's things that you don't want to have a bad cornea and then try to put in one of these lenses that's going to try to do more. You don't want to have a bad red and try to put in one of these lenses that does more. So there's things to think about. Um, it's very important in our situation that we meet with our patients and engage them and they become, uh, they come out and they feel you're your friend of that patient. They're going to go tell a lot of their friends about you and that's going to help out you in your practice and I think that's no matter where you are, that's very important. So your patients have to be more than just another category. They have to be somebody who I always try to connect with them. We charge a fair amount. Um, if you look at what we get paid for cataract surgery in the U.S., we get paid about $600 for each eye. Yet we're charging three times that much for these lenses that are going to be more expensive lenses. So you really got to gain the trust of that patient and, and really got to get the results that you want. We have a lot of different choices that are out there to make them better. And that's a nice situation. But it's also something that requires time to talk to these people. And as that progresses here, you'll find that same thing. But the basic principle of having the patient like you and you trying to do the best for that patient is always going to win no matter what country you're in, no matter what you're doing. Um, and I, I think that's, that's definitely a very important part. We have a lot of pre-screening of patients. Um, I'm, I'm sure you have the OCT um, where you're going to actually look at that retina better. I did my cornea fellowship at UCLA. I know the very front of the eye very well. I certainly know the back of the eye. But I found for me to give a great opinion on what it looks like I do, it could not be attained without the OCT. The OCT, I'm not going to miss something in the back of the eye. That's very, again, important in any cataract So if you can get all these new technologies, again, it's making it better. Topography, to try to take an unusual looking cornea, keratonic cornea, or a very regular stigmatism cornea, to try to put one of these new special lenses in, is looking for trouble. You're looking to make the patient unhappy. It's very important that you try to uh, make sure you're, you're putting the, the best lens in, in the best situation for these patients. 
you empower your staff. In the United States, I'm not sure what happens here, but our staff measures the eye for how long it is and the curvature to come up with what the power of the lens should be. And I need that as a good guide to start with. But when they're doing that test, they can tell if the cornea is unusual. There's ways they can tell if they have a hard time getting the results. They need to be able to come to you and tell you, hey, I'm concerned about this patient. Something's different. And then you can make some adjustments and see that patient again. Because ultimately, whatever the results of that lens power is, is going to be a reflection on you on how good a surgeon you are. And you want to be the best surgeon you can be. So I think it's very important that you have your staff that's working with you be an extension of you. Be friendly to them, open to them, be happy if they come to you with a problem. That's very important. My staff is very good about that. And they know that I trust them to do the right thing. Surface irregularity, we have a lot of people that wear contacts, and contacts um, can be a problem if they don't take them out. Um, a lot of these people that are very highly nearsighted always wear their contacts. They don't have glasses. Yet when we want to measure the power, if we quickly take out their contract, contacts and they quickly do the measurement, it can be way off. I'm not doing that measurement. Again, my staff has to realize that and tell them they got to be out of their contacts uh, for as long as they can to get the best result that they can. Dry eyes. I think dry eyes are a very common problem in my cataract patients. I'm quick to put plugs in, things to stop the drainage of tears. Uh, artificial tears frequently before these calculations are very important. All these things are going to produce a better result. And the perception from the patient is you're a better surgeon. And I think we all want to be that. I mean, I think all of us, our biggest enjoyment is to make somebody happy to see one. Um, anterior basement membrane dysfunctions, we have a lot of those in, in our older patients, and we have to take care of that if we, if we recognize it. What we have, and I don't know as much for you, and it's probably going to be a little bit easier. I have at least 15% of my patients that have had lacing or radioperitonium that are coming now for cataracts. In that instance, they have paid to change their eyes so they don't wear glasses. And they're willing to pay extra to do it again. But they're not willing to wear glasses after they've paid that amount. So these people need to be discussed a little bit closer, because when you do refractive surgery, whether it's LASIK, that makes it a little harder to get that calculation to just right. And we all know there's different formulas, or, or we do in the U.S., you know there's a lot of different formulas to get it right. But when you calculate for all those different formulas they have for people that have refractive surgery, it's amazing how different the results are. And so those people need to have special consultation to understand when I'm done putting the lens in and when we're done with the refract, the your care of the cataract, we may have to touch that up because in reality it's really hard to get that just right. If you don't discuss those type of situations with the patient before the operation, they again think you didn't do a good job of surgery. So it's very important to they understand you're behind them and you want the best for them. But they have to be willing to do a little bit extra. And, and I certainly am, because my reputation depends on the patient doing well. Radio keratotomy, I don't know how often that was performed. Um, but as we all know, radio keratotomy, the slits in the eye, is a weakening procedure. And the reason radio keratotomy works is it weakens the cornea out here push out here and flattens it centrally. As people get older, they usually have progression of that flat. And we see a lot of people that were at aggressive radio keratotomy that their morning vision is very different than their afternoon vision. So we have to take that into consideration. 
with that lens that you're putting in, you're trying to hit a moving target. That cornea is going to move a little bit in the morning and the afternoon, and the patient has to understand that. You try to hit a target, it's going to correct them at best so that at least sometime during the day, they're either seeing distance or they're seeing near. That's when those lenses that move a little will draw a confidence can help us out and get them a little bit closer. But the patient has to be a, un, understand that concept before you operate. Otherwise, again, you're the cause of their problem. Myopic LASIK and hyperopic LASIK, uh, I find that barometer that I talked about can produce a much better result and it is a nice thing to have. Uh, you probably don't have the number of patients that we have in the U.S. that have LASIK and that's probably a good thing. But when you run across them, just remember they're not the same. Um, our patients that come in with these multiple choices of lenses, they're really coming to us for their expertise. And so they really want to know what the best lens is for them. And that's where it comes up for us to look at them, decide what the patient wants, what they need. That can be a standard lens that's good for distance, or you can make it good for near. You need to talk to that patient and decide what they want. And the patient will go by with whatever you say. If you tell them this is the lens that's the best choice for them, if they can afford it, they will, they will do that lens. If you give them, I've got three different choices, and don't give them guidance to the right choice, they get all confused and they go away. So it's very important that we at least tell them there are choices, but here's what I recommend to you. They may choose a different direction, but at least they've got the guidance. I think multiple choices really confuse patients. These lenses that move, the accommodative lenses, um, like I said, the post-refractive cases, certainly the RKs, where the cornea is changing throughout the day, those are really good choices. Those patients that don't read that much because these accommodative lenses are good for distance and good for intermediate, but they're not good for reading. Um, and those with significant irregular cornea stigmatism, some do a lot better with those lenses than the diffractive lenses. The diffractive lenses, which are the ones with the rings, are good for people that have close refractive and low amounts of custom view because their cornea is fairly regular and normal. Uh, they're good for people that come in, and we have a lot of patients that come in, and they want to get rid of glasses. <coughs> they're hyperopic, they're 50 years of age and can't no longer read. They're very good for those lenses because they will. Those lenses will give good distance and they will go good read. But they have to understand that they'll have a little halo with the rings. And so we have to spend a lot of time talking to them about those specific choices. And I'm sure with your different lenses that you have, there's pluses and minuses to each one. The torque lenses in the U.S. really took off much more than the multifocal lenses. Because the torque lenses, for us, were very easy for us to understand. We were going to make them like the other patients, except they just weren't going to have to wear glasses. They were going to have to have reading glasses, and the patients were, for the most part, able to do that. Um, you need to have an intact bag with that, of course. Um, I thought this one worked. This didn't come up. It, uh, this was the lens when I got done with it. My bag was not intact, and he had six thousand of astigmatism. And there are ways to do it. It's a little more tricky, but you can put the op, the the uh, athletes in the bag that does have a uh, break in the bag, and you can optic capture on your good capsule rexes. And that's what I did in this case, and I think that's an option. But for the most part, I don't usually put in any toric lenses with somebody that's got non-intact bag. So that, that's something that I have to spend. They're paying you extra for something you spend a lot of time on. 
when somebody has six staff of correction and astigmatism, you've already got his other eye, and there's a problem with the second eye, you're going to have to correct that in some way. And that's why I took the uh, unusual situation where I put it in but not in that back. But I made sure I did optic capture in the guy who fantastic. Uh, it's very important that the accommodations that you are able, that you don't mind not having to read, they call it a broader range of vision, and I think that your uh, symphony lens is going to be much more like that, the type of lens that we have. From everything I understand, I, you guys might be able to tell me better, but that's a lens that's going to be very good for distance, and it's going to be very good for intermediate. My patients are very happy with that for the most part, especially the male patients. Uh, female patients sometimes want a little bit more reading, uh, so it has to be uh, taken under consideration. But the, the true line in this situation, the stigmatism is very, very successful. We've had multiple different platforms <coughs> for this lens, and each one is going to be the, the next greatest thing. And sometimes that's correct, and sometimes it gets worse. Uh, we have a little problem with the, uh, the HC over here, where it was supposed to be the late, next greatest thing. I put it in a very prominent TV actor in California, and uh, the results just weren't what they said, and, and others found it. But that's what we found out at the meeting, when you started talking to others. That's why you go to the meetings, that's why you go talk to about any new lens that comes out. You say, hey, you know, how does it do with that lens? And if you're an early adopter, it's really important you're at the meetings because when you're first putting it in, you don't maybe do enough yourself to know if it's a good or a bad thing. And then when we went back to the AO model, it was a much better lens. And that's been here with us for a long time, since 2009. We got to get correction. You will have those same types of transitions, and it'd be great. Um, <coughs> some of these that lost the. Again, this is that you can see all these cells that came off this anterior capsule by cleaning them. And that's very important to get those off so those lens stays in the proper I think you guys have the, the multi-focal lenses, um, or these little rings are there. Um, we've had one power for a long time, where we had good distance and good intermediate, which was probably a little too close. Um, they had halos at night time, and they had to pull it a little too close on our original type of lenses. We've much improved that where we now have different powers that can allow us to see. And that's really been a big improvement. They talk about neuro adaption with these lenses, with the rings. And neuro adaption is when you learn to filter out that halo effect from these lenses. I would say that's a very true effect. Um, I put a lot of these lenses in. I would say 10% of my patients complain about the halos driving at night in a significant way. And that was my one problem with this lens. But I would say almost 98% of those people that complained about it significantly did not complain a year out. So these lenses I think really work well and they stay. The nice thing is if you can read with it and you can see distance with that lens, and they get used to these rings, it's there forever. That's a great thing. It's never going to go away. Um, the bad thing is, if they really were to complain, they didn't get used to it, it's never going to go away. And then you have to cut these lenses out and put a different lens in. Um, like I said, I've not done that. Um, I've done it for other reasons, and they've done fine. But I've not done that because I carefully explain about the arrows. And they know that they're going to have that. And over time, that improves, and I found that it really works well. We have a broad range of vision now that we can do, plus 
35 and 34, that's great. Um, if the aura, when, whenever you, if you get used to that machine, you have to pull four different lenses to be in the room because you're going to operate on them, you're going to take out the cataracts, you're going to measure, and then it's going to tell you what's the appropriate lens. So that's a lot of work, and that's a lot of things to have, to have around. But that's the kind of thing that we progress when we're shooting, trying to get higher and higher, getting more accurate, more accurate we have to do. Um, these are the different multifocals, the original one. Um, you can see here, 33 centimeters. Many of my patients would say, I can't read. I can see distance, but I can't read. You would check your distance vision, it was good. They would hold up the reading card and say, I can't read. And then you bring it into the 33 inches and they say, I can read there, but I can't read. So you have to be very careful to understand what that patient is really like. It could be, you know, if it's a small person, shorter arms, they may want the higher cat. It may be, your culture might be the, the, the tighter ad, the closer you hold it, might be good for them. If somebody's got really long arms and they're, they're reading their paper out here, they're not going to be happy with that. And so that's why we have all these different ads now, where you can be 42 inches or 50, uh, 42 centimeters or 50 centimeters. And that really has helped us out. Again, it's tailoring that to the patient. I think that's really important. My experience may not be your same experience here, but I can tell you these principles are really important to try to figure it out and get the best result for your patients. Uh, for some reason, yeah, you actually reduce the halos and flares on the data. So that's what they're coming to us and telling us, that the halos and flares is much better. And now it comes to us as physicians that are actually in out there actually putting these lenses in to see if that's true. You never believe your salespeople that are selling you something completely. I think they're very important to talk to and they often have extremely good ideas. But they're looking at it in a very myopic way where they're looking at, you know, what are all the great benefits of this lens that I'm trying to sell you. But in the end, we're dealing with the patients day in and day out, so you really have to spend a lot of time and see what is worth it. Um, I think some of the videos didn't get embedded here. Um, I'm just going to go to my computer and get some of these things on. Uh, And then I'm going to show you some other pictures out in just a little bit. But we, we have to close the wound tightly. I don't know if you have the glue. I'll show you here in a minute what it's going to be glued. I'm going to show you the Wong incision here. The Wong incision is a very nice thing if you're not doing to close these wounds tight.
to steal it at the end, and I found it really works well. The glue only lasts for 24 hours. It's not even that long. It's gone. Just enough for your wound to heal. Very good. But that's another nice thing. That's the verified there. I think this is what I'm going to share with you. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to this. Alan, do you have your talk right now? Um, I think we're at five minutes from break. Okay. We'll see what else we have. I think this is stuck in. So here's. So here's the true line. Now see, this is a stimulus of the direction. You can see this moving around here, saying go this way, go that way. That's what I'm looking for when I put the torque lens in. So I get it when it's just not moving. It's still going that way. Put this in. The lights go down in the room, it doesn't go down this. And then I fill it up and I make the cornea nice and smooth with BSS and put this right in the center. And then I do this measurement, it takes 40 measurements, and it tells me if I need to rotate it right or left. And here again it says no rotation. And so that's how you put that forward lens in there. And it really makes a, a, a huge difference in my results. I don't rotate towards lenses anymore when I put it in four prong rotation. I still, on the Alcon Torx lens, if you've got a long eye, that's a very big bat. And I find if it's a long eye and my axis is with the rule of stimulus, so the lens is rotated like this, 6 and 12 o'clock, I find those lenses move in the opposite direction you can rotate them on a not infrequent basis. So you got to watch that. If I ever find a torch lens moves, I just wait two weeks. Let the epithelial cells start to grow. Go back in. Don't use viscoelastic to fill the anterior chamber. Just use BSS. Free the lens up a little. Move it back into position. And those cells that are sort of grown help you to be sticky. And without the viscoelastic in there, it's less likely to move. I don't tightly fill the wound in those cases. Because I think the torque that have two point fixation. You don't want to have the anterior chamber fill as high as you can because I think that allows it to move in the back. I've never had to move a lens twice. I found in that situation they always stay right where I want them. So that's a nice situation for us. I think torque lenses in the U.S. has been the most satisfying thing for all physicians. They really feel like those lenses. You just don't get people to complain, and they're very happy to pay more for those kinds of stuff. And, uh, anything you'd like to add? There? Okay, I think we'll take a break a little bit early, and uh, we'll come back. Time. 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 Time.